Thank you very much, Paul, for, for introduction. I would like to thank Dr. Fan and also the IFRI for inviting me to talk about <coughs> the the progress of economic reforms in Myanmar, which started uh, f five years ago in 2011. As you know, Myanmar, being a Southeast Asia country, is uh, rich in natural resources, and then our economy is uh, mainly about agriculture. And um, some time ago, uh, Myanmar or Burma was known to be a rice bowl of Asia. So that's how we have dominated the rice trade uh, <clears throat> since uh, 1930s uh, and up, up until uh, early 70s that we were the, the uh, largest rice exporter to, to, to the war. And, um, but unfortunately, um, we had the military coup in 1960s and then that really changed the country from the course of joining the rest of the Southeast Asia when the, the whole Asia was uh, benefiting from more export-oriented uh, economic policies. So we have been isolated since 60s and um, due to some human rights um, <clears throat> violations in the late 80s, we were also become su subjected to international isolation. So up until five years ago, uh, Myanmar was uh, termed as the second most isolated country in Asia uh, after North Korea. But uh, as many of you might have already visited, uh, we had the, uh, uh, the visit of uh, Dr. Fan uh, about uh, two weeks ago, and then also the Paul and many of IFRI colleagues have been visiting, but uh, now we are completely open up, and then we have also done a number of uh, <coughs> economic reforms. So today we are, uh, I, I would present <coughs> about the update on the, the progress of economic reforms and what needs to be done, particularly in the agriculture and the trade sector. Um, uh, in terms of <coughs> um, <coughs> summarizing what has already happened uh, in the country since uh, the country opened up in 2011, I just put it up here, but in short, what we did was a classic uh, reform strategy about macroeconomic stabilization and structural adjustment. And that we were able to <clears throat> accomplish many um, outstanding results in terms of stabilizing the economy uh, through classic uh, macroeconomic uh, uh, adjustments, um, such as the chain rate unification, interest rate, the central bank became independent. But on the other hand, <clears throat> we are still in the midst of undertaking a much more serious and deeper reforms through the structure adjustments. This is where I think uh, <clears throat> last government was succeeded in stabilizing the economy, but on the other hand, they were short of uh, delivering the fruits of the economy reforms to the population. So I think when we uh, <clears throat> conducted uh, very free and fair elections in last November. Uh, the opposition, the National League for Democracy, won a landslide victory, and now they are uh, up and running uh, since uh, last April. And so the task remain at hand is uh, to go deeper uh, reforms, especially in the area of uh, <clears throat> economic integration, integrating the economy with the regional and global economies. So this is where I wanted to uh, focus my presentation about connecting the global value chains. I think that is easier said than done because uh, Myanmar was so isolated until recently. And so we have been um, quite uh, <coughs> inaccessible to many of the global markets, including the United States and the European markets, because these countries also impose sanctions since uh, 1997. Uh, actually, the United States uh, uh, even tightened up uh, much uh, more comprehensive sanctions in 2003. And so we are still in the midst of uh, rolling back uh, many of these sanctions and trying to reintegrate with the war. So connecting the, the global value chain is, uh, is a much uh, challenging task for Myanmar right now. So what we have done so far in the last five years in terms of domestic reforms, now is the time to uh, go out of the 
the country and then try to find the market so that we can be uh, <clears throat> be exporting and that we can actually generate incomes and profits so that we might be able to redistribute for the producers at home. So the agriculture that I'm talking about is quite huge. Um, it's uh, probably it's a, it's a very uh, unusual situation in Southeast Asia because uh, most of the Southeast Asia has also gone into much more manufacturing state in terms of industrialization. But in Myanmar, uh, agriculture is still the mainstay of the economy. Um, it's 30% uh, of the GDP, and then uh, of course uh, t uh, near, uh, nearly tw 20 to uh, now it's reduced to 10% of the um, export. And but in terms of uh, employment, uh, it also provides uh, jobs for the 70% of the population. Um, but um, our agriculture uh, is mainly dominated by smallholders, and then we also have a land situation. And poverty is also deeply entrenched, uh, mainly because uh, very lackluster growth in the agriculture sector. Because uh, World Bank recently stated that the Myanmar is one of the fastest economy, so we are enjoying something like eight percent growth rate for the last four to five years. But um, these are mainly um, uh, attributed by the service uh, economy and foreign direct investment. The agriculture is still facing a lot of uh, slow growth. And so I think that's how the poverty is still hasn't resolved yet. And then our export basket are uh, relatively small, so we depend on only a few items. So I think that really also make us very difficult to connect with the global value chains. And then the role of the government in upgrading the chains are also very important. And then now we have a new players, what we call the regional government. So we are actually moving away from the very centralize the British system of um, uh, <clears throat> uh, administration into a much more uh, United States like a federal structures and then I think this is where the region the rule of the regional governments become quite critical in uh, undertaking the reforms and in terms of <clears throat> uh, agriculture value chains um, we had the privilege of working very closely with the IFPRI and then also the Michigan State University and that we are doing a many analysis on the various uh, agriculture value chains. And so this is a kind of a general pattern that we have found so far. So there are a lot of gaps in all these value chains. So both in the, the upstream, the production, in the middle stream processing, and as well as uh, getting into the downstream and then also assessing to the market. So you can see there are strong areas where we traditionally have a very strong role of the government in helping some of the production uh, side, but uh, the, the, they are the, some, the, the paler part and then also some blank uh, blocks where I think we need a lot of uh, uh, help. So in terms of <clears throat> the quality infrastructures, in terms of R&D for the agriculture sectors, and then also um, getting <clears throat> to the standards where we can actually reach to the global market is relatively very poor uh, in capacity and quality. So I think this is where uh, we are facing a number of challenges. And then, <clears throat> as I said, the, the, the currently the regional governments are a new players in the agri agri uh, agri uh, agrarian reforms because uh, Myanmar, we, we have a kind of a three seasons and then we have um, various uh, agroclimatic conditions and then we have like beaches, we have a hilly part, we have a dry zones and desert-like conditions. So because of all these uh, <clears throat> diverse agroclimatic zones and the diverse populations, and then also we are squeezed between the two big neighbors, China and India, and then the, what China uh, imports and what India imports from us are totally different. Then I think this is where diversification of our agriculture sector has become key. And uh, in championing that uh, reform and diversification, I think the role of the regional governments are quite critical. So this is a, a new uh, player on the block where I think we are seeking help from the international development partners to pay attention to some of the role, key roles that these governments can do. Because, and um, now that uh, Myanmar is hosting, a, one of the historic uh, 
uh, peace conference in the country right now, uh, right uh, uh, happening right now. And our leader, Don San Suu Kyi, has invited uh, 700 delegates from all over the country. We are quite um, in inspired by what has happened in Colombia for fort ending of, uh, 50 years of civil war. And then actually, we, our civil war is a little longer than that, maybe about 60 years. Uh, so we are trying to <clears throat> um, do a lot of these talks. And um, so the regional governments can also champion the reforms because in terms of uh, reform progress, now we are at the stage where we are stuck. It's just the implementation. And then in terms of value chain management, I think this is a time for us to connect with the markets. And then the, the regional governments are located uh, closer to our regional economies and perhaps they can actually connect that. And then also in terms of democratization, we have a popular support, we have a political will, but we don't have the capacity to deliver. So this is where I think the regional governments can also play a role. Um, <clears throat> uh, coming back to what we work right now in the country together with the Mi Michigan State University in IFPRI, we are actually trying to uh, do a lot of uh, programs um, in terms of evidence-based research, knowledge sharing, and delivery assistance for the public and the private institutions, and then more <clears throat> public advocacy to to uh, deepen the reforms. And then um, the key areas of concerns are policy coordination. We have uh, several uh, ministries involved in uh, one value chains, and we really need to uh, promote coordination. And this is where we also need champions. So this is where I think the regional governments can play a role of a champion to coordinate all these uh, different stakeholders. The institutions are lacking, so we are in the midst of uh, building institutions. And the governance, uh, the value chain governance is also very important. And the development cooperation, I think we need further help from the United States. And this is where I wa wanted to focus uh, the rest of the <clears throat> time to talk a little bit about the historic uh, relationship between the Myanmar with the big markets. The, because the big markets are very important in terms of lifting the, the value chains. And then uh, we had, we, we, we used to have, you know, uh, the country was so isolated throughout the years. In the 80s, <clears throat> we have a very, um, uh, very little relationship with both China and U United States. I try to compare between the two countries because you can see a very contrasting outcome uh, after uh, 30 years of relationship. So <clears throat> uh, in the uh, 90s, um, we sell, uh, we export uh, agriculture products uh, to the United States, uh, mainly about fish and a few other uh, agriculture products. And then also the garment is another uh, key commodities that we export to the United States. And then we had the uh, sanctions, uh, very se severe sanctions in 2003. This is where our trade with the United States go to zero uh, by 2005. And then right now, Myanmar export to China is about 5 billion. And then we can only export about 50 million to the United States. So this is how uh, it's a big difference. And then <clears throat> we are <clears throat> also um, uh, improving relationship with uh, the European Union. The European Union in 2013 have also decided to reinstate the generalized uh, system of preferences, the trade preferences to Myanmar, um, due to um, <clears throat> our reforms and as well as in response to the other decision. Uh, then <clears throat> this is a kind of a sample that probably, uh, you know, the lifting the sanctions doesn't really help, uh, but unless uh, you add it up with uh, more help to upgrade the value chains. And this is how the European has done it. So they have done what is called the Myanmar Sustainable Aquaculture Program, which is to help the small fishermen and mainly about the small holders. And then they also have a trade development program, which is to connect these small holders to the European market. So I think this is how uh, they try to <clears throat> integrate the lifting of the uh, sanctions or the restoring of the GSP together with the help for the small uh, fishermen and then also try to upgrade our quality infrastructure so that we can sell our fish to the European market. So this is how uh, 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 
kind of a <clears throat> re-engagement with the key international uh, development partners as far well as the uh, global markets can uh, go uh, extra mile uh, when we have a synergy of all these uh, development systems. And then we also have uh, done a number of uh, other reforms in terms of trade and labor, and then we, in terms of labor relations uh, and the labor rights, uh, we have also set up a number of laws and then also the, 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 the most notable achievement was the minimum wage, which we have been trying to set it for the last six years, never been successful, but for the first time in the history, we were able to set the rate because we have a, a very nice uh, tripartite relationship that we have built between the government, the labor unions, and then the private sector associations. We are also trying to uh, finish up the IPR law which is actually was uh, submitted to the parliament, but the parliament uh, uh, with the elections and they have not been able to finalize it. But the, the new parliament is going to adopt that as a law. By then I think we are meeting a number of other requirements so that our hope is by the time that our leader Dawn San Suu Kyi visit the United States in the next uh, few weeks, uh, she is actually meeting with President Obama and then we can uh, kindly uh, appeal to the United States government to uh, consider recertifying the GSP because I think we have gained quite a bit uh, from the European GSP certification process. And um, <clears throat> this is the last slide. Um, I would say that um, um, <clears throat> with um, uh, the GSP status that we have enjoyed uh, from the uh, European Union and then also potentially with the US, we can kick, quickly attract the foreign direct investments into the agriculture sector from the non preferential countries in the region. So I think this is, I, I, we saw that as a strategic opportunity because many of our uh, neighboring economies are already uh, moved uh, forward and then they are looking for uh, ways to outsource many of their production uh, sectors and then Myanmar is uh, nicely located in the very dynamic region and the GSP uh, uh, I actually gave an example of the rubber here as you can see in the map all our rubber plantations are located in the very strategic Southeast Asia rubber region uh, which actually supply 80 to 90 percent of the global demand and um, many of the Thais, Malaysians, and Indonesians can actually uh, come and do business in Myanmar, enjoying the GSP status, and then they actually they can make profits, and then we can actually earn a lot of income out of that. Um, that the, the last thing that I would like to remind, of course, uh, you 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 have perfectly aware that the democracy uh, <clears throat> is is a good system, but it would be a better system if it delivers delivers the, the development dividends and the reform. Uh, benefits to the population and this is where uh, international uh, promotion of democracy can also take a positive strategy so incentivizing reforms and linking with the uh, global markets and this is where I think uh, global connecting global value chains can be the most important mission uh, ahead of us. Thank you very much for your attention.